This is a three-minute introduction to the audio-described version of Hannah Glass, The Rebels, presented by Northumberland Archives and the November Club. This film lasts ten minutes. Hannah Glass, a country gentlewoman of the 18th century, is in her sixties. She is sturdily built with wide, pale blue eyes. Her silver-blonde hair has been pinned up and mostly tucked inside a white mob cap perched at the back of her head, a few wispy curls left framing her face, along with a small pair of pearl and gold earrings. She carries herself upright, shoulders squared, and her movements are brisk and decisive. Hannah wears a rigid corseted bodice of forest green worsted with a subtle vertical bronze stripe, two lines of brocade along the fastening, and elbow-length sleeves. It is laced up the back. White muslin has been artfully draped and folded around the neckline as a modesty panel and pinned at the top centre of the corset with a round green and white cameo brooch. Her matching skirt is mostly covered with a pleated white apron and has a small bustle at the back. She stands in her kitchen, a large airy room with tiled walls, the bottom half emerald green and the top white. The floor is of large grey flagstones. There is a green painted door in the rear right corner and an inset window in the right hand wall, its frame and shutters painted in the same forest green shade. There is a striped jug full of wildflowers on the window sill, and above the door a white faced clock, the time in Roman numerals. Against the rear wall is an enormous oak dresser, easily three metres wide and almost the full height of the room. The top two shelves display decorative rows of prized plates and platters in blue and white Chinese or Delft ware and green and cream Staffordshire pottery. Below this, a line of cups or bowls is partially hidden by hanging bundles of herbs, feathery thyme, bristly rosemary, mauve-flowered marjoram and golden tansy. On the dresser's countertop, above the rows of drawers, stand a variety of stoneware jugs, baskets, a weighty mortar and pestle, and a set of weighing scales with brass weights. Set against the right wall is a deep, square, white ceramic sink. Mounted above it, a large, cage-like wooden rack for drying dishes. Blue and white striped tea towels hang beside it. In the middle of the room are a pair of long tables with smooth oak tops, arranged in an L-shape, parallel to the rear and right-hand walls. The surface of the table facing us is strewn with flour, several large mixing bowls upon it. On the far left is a large elaborate cake with pink and white icing, and in front of it a tall pointed white item is a sugar cone, a column of densely packed sugar. The rightmost table holds several baskets packed with fresh leafy produce and one of potatoes. A shelf below it holds several domed silver serving platters and tureens in various sizes. Northumberland Archives and the November Club present The Rebels. Hannah Glass hurries across her kitchen to the sink and briskly washes her hands. Picking up a damp cloth, she strides back to face us across the table. I am so angry and so afeard. She picks up bowls. I must distract myself. And moves them aside. I have just beaten 24 egg whites with sugar for a cake icing. It took two hours of beating with my birch whisk. And though my arm is aching, my mind is still restless. With a cloth. I confess, my daughters, Henny and Peggy, took a turn. She wipes down the tabletop. It's still hard work, even with help. Clearing it of flour. She looks up at us. I am so sorry. I have forgot my manners. Clasps hands in front of her. Hello again. Hannah Glass. We have met before, I believe. But you were not looking at all well then. How very much improved you are. My plague recipe must be working. I'm so glad I got it to you in time. Oh, and thank you for sending your recipes to me. I have enjoyed seeing them. You rose admirably to the challenges we set you. Barbara Golightly's little cherry pies were wonderful. She leans in. I might borrow her recipe for my next edition. But what are M and M's, I wonder? She shakes her head and shrugs. I will ask at the market. Oh, and I would very much like to know where Ben Wolsey found his fairy ring mushrooms. 
especially given the recipe I'm going to share with you later. She glances across. Now I must put the finishing touches to my cake. At the ornate pink and white cake, she lifts it carefully on a board and moves it to the centre of the table. The top is adorned with a figure surrounded by crowns and roses. I have used licorice juice for the ermine on the crowns. Can you see? She points. I am adding the last of these pretty candied flowers. Picks up a plate from the dresser. You will find a method for making them in my book, The Complete Confectioner. Pops on another rose. Oh, I should add that if you are making an icing, our eggs are much smaller than yours. So if you wish to follow my example, perhaps 18 would be sufficient. She picks up another flower. This cake will go by cart. Carefully applies it. My dear aunt in Northumberland. Please God, it may bring some cheer. And another. She wrote to me about the Scotch rebels. I thought they were but a swarm of wasps to be quickly swatted away. Though still, I was concerned. With effort, lifts the cake. There is great fear that there are Scotch sympathisers in Hexham. Moving it to the dresser. So no one can rest completely at ease. Even if the army drive the devils back over the hills. Along with the plate, turns with a frown. I do not know why they must persist. Are we not one union under one king? Crosses to the sink. But we have our own worries here in London too. For the wretched French may come at any time. Washing her hands. I do wonder why we always seem to be at odds with our neighbours. Or rather, why they are always at odds with us. And drying them on a tea towel. Of course, the French are in league with the Scotch. And that is why they are coming at us from the south, while the rebels are causing so much trouble in the north. Returning to the table. So you see, my family in Northumberland and we here in London are besieged. And of course, this causes great scarcities. Leaning her knuckles upon it. I cannot recall the last time I saw milk at a fair price. She points. That sugar for my cake comes from a dwindling store of cones that I have put in a secret place for fear of thieves. To the tall white loaf. Now. Dabbing her hands. Since you too. With a cloth. May be suffering from shortages because of difficulty getting things from the continent. I'm going to show you how to make some mushroom ketchup with mushrooms that Mr Glass has fetched me. So, though there be but little beef or pork to be had, and most of that very bad, you may still add flavour to any dish. She arranges bowls in front of her. This recipe is from my very first edition. It is for sea captains to take on a voyage and it will last for 20 years. Takes a basket of mushrooms. Take two quarts of the largest flaps of mushrooms gathered dry. She picks one up. Not at first dawn. And breaks it apart. Bruise them with your hands until they come into pieces. You may be vigorous, but not violent. <laughs> they are not your enemy. Placing pieces back in the basket. At least we can still gather our own mushrooms and not rely on others for them. I do think that it is a great joy to go into a wood or a meadow and seek out the best mushrooms. But be careful. Mr Glass knows his fungi and can pick the best. If you are not similarly well versed, you must go with one who knows. Or Take your treasures to an apothecary to be identified. She reaches for a large copper pan. Put your mushrooms into a large pan in layers. She drops the torn handfuls in. With a dusting of salt between each layer. Sprinkling on coarse white flakes. Not too much salt, but enough to draw off the juices of the mushrooms. More mushroom pieces. More salt. Let that sit for an hour while you gather a gallon of strong stale beer. You see, nothing should go to waste when supplies are short. And the stronger and staler the beer, the richer the ketchup will be. Turns to the dresser. Also, a stoneware jar. A pound of anchovies recovered from the pickle. Do not put your hands into the pickle jar or you will spoil the pickle. 
use a wooden spoon with little holes in it. Also, a pound of shallots, peeled. Dips a bowl of whole shallots into the pan. For your spices, take half an ounce of mace. Adds the papery dried herb. Half an ounce of cloves. Whole cloves. A quarter of an ounce of pepper. Added to the pan. And three or four races of ginger. Whole ginger roots. You may bruise them in your mortar, but it is not necessary if you are in a hurry. Mix it well together and cover closely. She puts on the lid. Let it simmer. Lifts the heavy pan. Until it is half wasted. That should take about four hours. In both hands. After four hours. And moves it aside. Let the mixture cool. Returning, she takes a bowl and a second pan. Then strain it through a flannel bag. She ladles mushrooms from the pan into a cloth laid inside the bowl. Be sure to squeeze hard, for mushrooms will be generous with their liquor when persuaded. And wrings the cloth, brown liquid spilling into the bowl below. When you have gathered all the liquid, bottle it in cold bottles. Two tall stoneware bottles labelled mushroom ketchup. Well corked. It will keep longer than any French invasion can last. She continues squeezing the bag. You may use it to flavour any dull dish. A spoonful beaten into a pound of fresh melted butter will make a marvellous sauce for a fish. She puts the bag aside. Or put it in a gravy. <laughs> Wipes her hands on a cloth, dips a finger in the bowl and tastes it. Mmm, delicious. For my part, should I ever have to endure a scotch haggis, I hope that a spoonful of ketchup will render it edible. She wipes her hands once more, mm. then smiling, tastes again. I am sure, no, really, I am, that we shall all be friends again before long. She casts her gaze down. This little patch of earth is too small to accommodate our quarrels. Well... That is my hope, in any case. Takes the bowl. Oh. And pauses. I wonder. She looks at us. Would you have any favourite family preserves or ketchup recipes you would be willing to share? If you do, there are two things you can do. One, please send your recipes to the Northumberland Archives, where they can keep them, as they have mine. And if you have a picture, that would be a wonderful thing to see. <laughs> and second, see if you can share them with someone you know as a gesture of friendship. She smiles. We must make more friends. Goodbye. Hannah takes the bowl across to the sink, picks up cloth, and begins to tidy the table. Fade to black. To share your recipes or find other Hannah Glass activities, visit www.northumberlandarchives.com forward slash learn. Filmed on location at National Trust Wallington, Northumberland. Hannah Glass is played by Judy Earle. Written by Fiona Ellis. Directed by Cynthia Hardy. Designed by Imogen Cloet. Music is Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 4, arranged by David Tobin, Jeff Megan, Julian Gallant and Rob Kelly. Film production by Magnus Dennison, Katya Roberts, Adam Opie and Sel McLean for Meerkat Films. With thanks to National Trust Wallington, Ivan Day, Richard Archer, Pins Petals Powder and Fern Avenue Antiques. Produced by the November Club in collaboration with Northumberland Archives. Supported using public funding by Arts Council England. The audio description was by Jane Ensel for Vocalise.